Today is testing day, and today I get to hang out in the woods, I get to play with a bunch of new knives, I get to play with some new wood stoves, I get to have a nice shore lunch right here on the shore of this lake, a nice cup of coffee, and read a good book. How do you beat that? Well, the only way I can think of it is to invite you along. If you're interested in seeing what I brought out, keep watching. All right, I think I'll start with the wood stoves that I brought out and then I will take a break, go get the bunch of knives that I have and bring those over and share those with you. Then we'll move on to making some lunch. And uh, actually there is a couple of items that I'm going to be using while I make lunch that are actually part of my testing today. And a couple of shout outs to viewers who gave me a couple of ideas around dehydrated meals or just trail meals that uh, I want to give out because they were great ideas and I'll be using those ideas today. And then I'm going to sit back with a cup of coffee and enjoy a good book that I've just started reading. But I want to share that book with you as well because I think that's also something you may be interested in. So let's get going with the stoves. All right, first one up, the Firebox Scout. Uh, yes, I know, this has been around for a while, Mark. What took you so long to get one of these and finally get around to testing it? Well, this one was given to me not long ago by Steve from the Firebox Stove. So thank you, Steve, for sending this out to me. When this came out on Kickstarter, I looked at it and, you know, I wasn't all that excited about it. I thought, and I think a lot of people thought, that this may have been the design that had been long rumored and long awaited that was going to be the in-between stove, the missing link between the full-size Gen 2 5-inch Firebox and the small Nano. Well, we now know, of course, that's not it. The, fire, the Firebox Freestyle was that stove, the in-between stove, and of course, what a stove it is. Now, this was something else completely different that Steve had envisioned, and he had a very specific use in mind for this, and a very very specific market that he was targeting and when I looked at it I I, I quite honest I didn't wasn't all that excited about it and here's the reason why let me take it out of the box now before anybody gets excited and gives me a thumb down and stops watching the video because they are in so in love with their firebox stoves I love my firebox stoves too please let me explain <laughs> oh sunshine here and I'm getting flashes off it. It's brand new, has not been used. Today will be the first time it gets used and has a fire in it. So what is it about this that I didn't particularly like or I wasn't all that excited about? To me, it looked like a square version of an IKEA hobo stove. And I thought, why wouldn't somebody just make an IKEA hobo stove and, uh, for, and save a whole bunch of money and maybe come up with something even a little bit more versatile? Okay, now that I have this, I think I better understand what it's all about. To start with, these are not expensive. They're the least expensive of all the stoves that you can buy from the Firebox stove. And if you're on a budget and you still want a commercially made stove that will fill the bill for most of you, people's uses, yeah, this I can see that's exactly where this fit in, especially if you don't want to go through the process of creating your own IKEA hobo stove. I get it. Now I get it. Okay. So that was my thought thinking process on it. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this stove in any detail because well, basically uh, I haven't used it yet. So I have to give it you know, a fair test. One of the things I was concerned about with this stove is because it is tin plated steel and not stainless steel, I was concerned about the durability of this, thinking that it would burn through and rust out in very short order. Uh, yet, yet to be proven right or wrong. But having said that, I posted that question on the Facebook group, the Firebox Stove Owners Group, and I had somebody respond that they've had 30, in excess of 35 fires in their Scout. All right, that's testimony enough to me. I think that says that this will withstand repeated use of hot fires. But I'm going to prove it for myself because, I, you know, it's still a little bit of a concern. And I, I just want to see if you can use it. If it'll withstand those fires with reasonable maintenance, then this is a viable option for somebody on a budget. It may not be as uh, versatile as the larger stove and certainly not the freestyle but it's much less expensive as well. All right, let's just very quickly show you what's involved in case you haven't seen one of these things. It comes with two of these. It's a 
square box-like affair that caps off and encloses everything inside because you can store things inside. The second one is on the bottom and that can be flipped over and used as a base for the stove. I've had people or I've seen people post that this could be used to boil water in on top of the stove. Maybe. Uh, I'm likely going to have something else. But when you consider the design intent, who this is intended for, then it does make some sense. This, I think, Steve, markets primarily as an emergency stove. This should be an all-in-one, inexpensive, compact unit that you can tuck away in the trunk of your car or your get-home bag or your bug-out bag or your emergency supplies or as a backup stove, a power failure stove, whatever else you want to call it, that will do everything you need to do for short term and not necessarily for long term. If you really want a heavy duty stove, buy the Gen 2 5 inch firebox. Well, you know, I think this does a lot of those things. Now, this, the one that Steve sent me, is the upgrade. There was two uh, sets. One was a basic version. I forget what the more advanced version or the more uh, kitted out version was, but uh, that's what he sent me, and I'll show you what came with it. Obviously, the instructions, which are always well done. Just dump everything out into my hands here. So the stove comes with two stainless steel rods, and those are used in conjunction with all the holes down the side here for uh, inserting a number of things, including a plate that I'm about to show you, but obviously for the Trangia, the Trangia gas adapter, other gas stoves, other alcohol stoves. These can be placed at different heights depending on what height you're looking for. There's the plate I'm talking about. So this is ideal for use with wood pellets. It's also designed with that depression in the center for use with esbitabs or other solid fuel, maybe gel fuel as well. And you can place it at the height you want it for. Of course, the stove can be used with wood primarily. It can be used with charcoal, wood pellets, as I mentioned, gas. So it really is a multi-fuel stove. The other thing that it came with was a set of crossbars. Now the crossbars, can be used in two fashion as crossbars like that. And they're really quite well designed and they'll actually lock into the top of the stove with little notches right here to prevent them from falling off. And they're just at a perfect height for most uses as you'll see when I do the full review. But you can also use these in parallel fashion like this and set them on top of the stove. And there's a couple of reasons why I might do that. I prefer parallel when I'm using alcohol so there's no metal getting in the way of the flame. But the other reason is, is once you have these set up in parallel, then you can do some baking using one of the zebra cans, like the 14 centimeter zebra. I'll be trying that out for sure. So yeah, it's a, uh, you know, basic design, lots of airflow, the small holes for using those rods through, the quintessential feed hole that Steve uh, pioneered, I believe, with the Gen 2 firebox or the original firebox that you can put long sticks in. It's all there. Now, it's just a matter of having a whole bunch of fires in this, and then I'll bring it back for review. All right, so the next two stoves that I have arrived literally in last night's mail. Uh, this will be their first use today. Okay, well, that's not entirely true. I used one of them to make myself a cup of tea with an alcohol stove a few minutes ago, but uh, the, neither of these stoves have had any wood fires in them. They're both from the same company, they're both from Goshawk out of Australia. Now, uh, I did a review of a stove that I purchased myself some time ago. It's known as the Goshawk Eddy 200 Pioneer. I think I've got that right. I'll be putting a link to it at the end of this video as well as in the video description. And in that video, I, I, there was a lot to like about the stove. However, there were a few things I felt needed improvement, or at least a few things you had to be cautious, cautious of when you use it. So I don't think it was my video that caused them to redesign the stove or to modify it or come up with a couple new versions. Maybe we were just thinking along the same lines after having used them for a while. But let me show you what they come up with. I have to tell you, these guys at Goshawk, are some of the most innovative, creative thinkers that I have ever uh, come across in, stove th in stoves. All right, so let's do the first one. First one is, still got the box. That's what I brought it out in. No, no container for it or no sack. This is the Eddy 206 Atomic, the titanium wood gasifier stove. And on the surface, it looks very much like the original one that I tested, but here's where things change. 
up and tucked up inside the base of the stove is an extension that will go on top. And let me put that on now. And it locks on in place. And on the top of that extension are little fold out legs. So they will uh, adapt to different size pots. You could use something very small because the bars do cross right over here in the center, although I can't think of anything too small. It's only 90 millimeters in diameter. Oh, actually, the body's only 90 millimeters in diameter. This is even smaller, less than th maybe, maybe three inches in diameter. So I can't think of too many pots that small. But there are stared or stepped notches on the pot stands so that you can use a 10 centimeter pot, like a 750 mil titanium pot, or you can use something larger. Now, it's tall and narrow as a result of that extension, so they actually built in titanium legs that swing out, hopefully that's showing up on the video there, to give it extra stability. Look at that. You now have a combination wood gasification stove and rocket stove all in one. I am excited to see how this performs. I expect it's going to be quite the atomic little stove. Yeah, let me see if I can give you just a few brief specifications for it. The weight of this thing is 5.7 ounces, which is 162 grams. Its height when it is all collapsed down is 3.9 inches or 100 millimeters. Its, its height when it is extended, like it is now, is 6.7 inches or uh, 170 millimeters, and the diameter is 3.5 inches or 90 millimeters. And that's the width of the widest part of the stove, because this will fit down inside a 750 milliliter pot for transport. So that's, you know, it's quite nice to be able to nest them. All right, that's one of the two stoves that they sent. Here is the other one, still in the box. This is the one I actually used to make my tea today. This one came as a more complete kit. This is the Eddy 205 Pioneer, Pioneer Pro Titanium Multi-Fuel Stove. Nice little stuff sack, so you know right away there's going to be a pot inside of it. There is a 750 milliliter pot inside. Uh, again, titanium, but this is a little different. This isn't a, like a lot of the others, like the Lixadas and those ones. The handle on this comes off of the pot. It helps lock the lid on for storage, but then when you're using this, you can slide it up through a little on the side, a little uh, holder on the side, and you have a lever. And I thought, oh, I don't know, you know, could I lose that? I guess the potential is there, unlike butterfly handles, that you could lose it. But I'll tell you what, when I just made lunch or made myself some tea, I realized the value. This isn't on. It's not getting hot. I can hold it aside. And when I'm ready to take it off of the stove, then I can insert it. And I don't have to worry about burning my fingers. The lid is tight. Not too many stoves. Not too many stoves like that where the lid, or it's not stoves, pots, where the lid is actually snug on top. It does have the stand-up little triangular D-ring. It does have graduated markings and metric and imperial down the side and a little tiny spout right here for pouring from. Great design little pot. Actually, that's like I said, I just made a cup of tea in it. All right, here is this stove. And again, it looks very much like the one I showed you before, very much like the original one that I have. To start with inside, is a titanium alcohol stove. This is one of the capillary action siphon types of stoves. It looks similar to the ones from Luxada and Tom Shu. It seems to be the same size, but this one for some reason feels more heavy duty. I've got to bring the two of them side by side. I also think that there are more jets on this one, but again, I haven't compared them. I used it and it brought my water to a boil real fast, I can tell you that, but I don't know too much about it. All right, I've mentioned before that search and rescue always seems to show up here when I'm doing a video. I can hear them. We're likely going to see them in a minute. All right, so what's special about this stove? Again, they have an extension. The extension sits down on the top. It has a little lock-in space, and then you pull it up. Okay, so here's the extension that goes on the top, and it can be used in two different ways. If you want to use it with the alcohol stove, you bring it up out of the grooves that it rested in and compact and sit it on little notches on top and you get about not quite a quarter inch clearance off of the top of the stove. Just enough 
to ventilate the stove for use with alcohol. And, uh, you know, it very protect it from the wind that way. So that's one way of using it. The other way is to take it out completely, turn it upside down, put those little projections down in the slots. I really should put my glasses on for this. And they have little notches that can help lock into just to make sure it stays in place. And on top here, we have pot supports. And the pot supports are slanted. They do have jimping or little uh, grooves on top so it'll hold your pot. So you can get a number of different pots. So if I was burning wood, this would sit on top like that, and I have enough clearance on top for uh, ventilation for exhausting the uh, gas, gases from the stove. It is a wood gas stove. It should work very effectively. It is extended by an inch and a little bit, an inch and a half at the most, so you should get a little bit of chimney effect on it. Um, again, I'm excited to try this one out. All right, some quick specs on this one. Oh, that's the other one. Okay, this is the Eddy 205 Pioneer Pro. The weight of this stove is 4.7 ounces or 135 grams. The diameter is the same as the other, 3.5 inches or 90 millimeters. The height when it's all compacted down is 3.9 inches or 100 millimeters. The height when it's open as it is right now is 5.1 inches or 130 millimeters. This is gonna be fun trying these little stoves out. If you're a stove nerd like I am, then this would be an exciting, it's like Christmas day for me. Okay, three brand new wood stoves. None of them have had a fire in it. I guess I'm gonna to have to do something about that today. But before I do, how about I move over and show you the knives that I have. All right, I needed that break. I had to get a drink of water. It's turning out to be a beautiful hot day here. You can probably see behind me the sun on the water and I'm starting to get it directly on me. So I'm gonna get moving so that I can move into the shade after I've got this done. Where am I going to start? Oh, let's just start with the one I have on my belt. So, this is the Green River Hunter. It is a knife made in the United States, originated Russell Knives, Green River Works, made in the United States, says so on the side. Um, you know, I've always liked the look of this, and uh, James Harris from Junkyard Fox uh, has always liked the look of this, and he actually had a line of custom knives that he designed based primarily on this, upgraded in a number of ways, and uh, I can see what he likes about it. Man, oh man. Now, I, brought, I bought this myself for a very specific reason. I had wanted to start sharing a few of the more budget priced knives that people could uh, purchase for themselves without having to break the bank and getting custom knives or any of the more expensive production knives. So this is a production knife. I've, it's getting dirty already. And uh, yeah, it came ready to go with one exception, no sheaf. So the company, I emailed and they said, oh, we can sell you a sheaf as well if you want. And I said, never mind. Okay, um, I'll, I'll go without the sheaf because I'll use a sheaf from another knife and then eventually make one or have someone else make one for me. So I, I have a sheaf that I'm wearing it on and it's, it's working just fine. So be aware that you, usually these are sold separate from their sheaves. So yeah. Uh, Again, not a whole lot to say about it. I've only been carrying it a short while, but I can really start to appreciate it. I'd like to refer to it, and this may be inaccurate, as an American Puko, because the handle is just a barrel shaped. Now, it's a little bit small for my hands, but you can see there's, it's a hardwood, it looks like walnut on the sides, held by three brass pins. It is just barrel shaped with, with flat uh, sides on it, rounded on the end, and no guard on it, a little bit, of a finger place here, a ramp here to use, but it has that somewhat of a butcher knife shape to it with the clip point uh, on the end of it. Makes it great for, you can skin with this, you can, you can butcher with it, you can food prep. It is a full flat grind. It looks like it is a 16th of an inch thick, and it's probably not exactly, it's probably a little bit bigger than that, but it is very thin. I understand it is 1095 steel, but hardened to 53 to 55, so much softer than most modern knives are when made with 1095 steel or any other high carbon steel. Uh, okay, 
the comment is or the criticism is when it's that soft you're going to dull it quickly uh, after use well so far no uh, but each day I use it I do take it home and strop it so I like to maintain my edges instead of letting them go all the way dark so or all the way dull I, I should say um, Maybe, but if it dulls quickly, that usually means it'll sharpen easily and quickly. So it remains to be seen. When I get to reviewing this knife, I'll make sure that I comment on that. Yeah, you know, I can actually see why James wanted one of these made in modern materials, and I may actually see about purchasing one of his knives because I, I get it, I really do. Even, even though it's a little bit small for my extra large hand, I still get it. This does most of what I want a knife to do out in the woods, you know, it, which is mostly food prep. If I expect I'm going to be doing wood processing, I mean, you can carve with this, you can do minor batoning with it, you know, little tiny splits for a fire, but nothing major. But uh, if I'm doing, uh, I expect to do wood prep, I'll bring one of the other knives that I'm about to show you. All right, so that is the first knife in this bunch. What else? I think I'll show you this one because I've had this one the longest and I, I honestly, I debated whether or not to uh, review it at all, but I think it's worth reviewing because it is an interesting design. So I saw this knife being reviewed by Jonathan Heffron on Wingman115 YouTube channel. And John and I uh, trade comments back and forth on videos and, and the like. And when I commented on it, his, his comment that he made is he would like a real bushcrafter to have, uh, take a hold of this knife and put it through his paces in bushcraft style. And uh, yeah, well, I, I had to pick him up on that. And, you know, no, no discredit to John. John is a very, very well-versed outdoorsman. He lives in Southern California, but he is from Maine, which is very close to where we live in this part of the hemisphere. And John is very skilled outdoors, so don't, don't let that fool you. He knew what he was doing when he was handling this knife, but I joked with him about I would take it and let a real bushcrafter hand it, and he sent it to me. This is the knife that John reviewed, and thank you, John, very much if you get a chance to watch this video. So what is it? All right, enough talk. What is it? This is the ANV P500. And you can see how it comes out of its leather sheath. Leather sheath is absolutely amazing. ANV, the symbol, I'll see if I can get a close up on it, stands for Acta Non Verba. I think it is Polish made. I'll correct myself on screen if I am wrong. You think I would know, and I do at home with all my notes, but it's like I said, it's been a while since I had this knife. I've been playing with it most of the winter. It is the traditional tracker design knife, except longer, thinner in this direction, top to bottom, and a little bit lighter overall, but it has that dual grind of a tracker knife. Uh, what can I say about it right off of the top? It is made with Sleipner steel, which I understand is a German variant of D2, but an improved variant, maybe a little bit better edge holding, a little bit better corrosion resistance. So it's regarded as a high grade uh, D2 type steel, not prone to chipping. I can tell you that I did drop it, I did chip it, and it was a lot of work to bring the chip out of this, but I was able to do it. It took me time, that's what I can say about it. But I took the opportunity to make a modification to this knife, so uh, in full disclosure, this is not in its fully stock format. I made a modification because immediately on receiving this knife from John and starting to play with it, one of the components or one of the design features of the original Tom Brown tracker um, appeared to be on this knife, but in fact wasn't. And that is what they refer to the quarter round or half round. You'd think I would know that. Right here, where the grind changes and swoops down, and it is a, quite a high uh, saber. It's not as low a saber. It is on the original Tom Brown. Look how tall that is right here. Look how tall that is. Very tall. Very, very slicey. But on this knife, the change between the two was very, very gradual. On the original Tom Brown tracker, it's quite a curve, like a quarter round curve. And that is a specifically designed like that for a number of things, such as uh, feathering. 
that quarter round will feather. It also allows for opening of the stomach lining or gut of an animal. You can get in there if you're very careful, of course, and use the knife to open up and do it in reverse. It can be used for uh, splitting wood. I liked it for actually lining up on a piece of wood and starting the drive down through with a baton on top. That's, you know, minor because you don't need that. Uh, you can score down bark with that and get a very controlled line on the side of the bark. There's a number of things that that little spot will do for you, but that wasn't doing for me on this. So when I did chip this steel and I had to resharpen it, I took the time to reprofile this a little bit right here in the corner. And uh, well, we'll see. When I get to do the full review, we'll see how well it works. It has uh, G10, I believe, G10 grips on it, huge bolts, uh, bolts, you know, right running through, which I thought I could take off because it does have Allen, Allen or Torx. Looks like Torx, don't have my glasses on again. Uh, I couldn't get it off. Now, I, I, if I tried hard enough, maybe I could get it off. Why would I want to get them off? It's kind of thin through here for my hands, but radius everywhere, no sharp back spawn. You know, you're not gonna strike a fire steel with this, but uh, you know, I have other tools for that. Lanyard hole came with a lanyard. Now, this is how I use a lanyard. It is palm swell here. And that's for chopping, right? And this is a chopper, not a heavyweight chopper, but a fast chopper. This is somewhere between a Tom Brown tracker and a modern interpretation of a Sami Luku. So that's where I put this. Do I like it? I love it. It's not a Tom Brown tracker. So that's the only comment I'll give on it now until I come to do the full review. All right, let's lay that one aside. I've got a pile of them here. Okay. John also uh, reviews a lot of knives from Work Tough Gear. In fact, he has a design that's being produced by Work Tough Gear. And when I saw John reviewing some of the Work Tough Gear knives, I thought, you know, they're interesting. I didn't know if they were my style of knives because primarily they're all huge knives, big knives. Some of them are very, I don't know, militaristic looking or very aggressive looking, and I wasn't interested in those. But when I saw my friend Wade from Woods Walker, uh, Wade, forgive me, Woods Walker 1965, Woods Walker 1965 on YouTube review a couple of knives from Work Tough Gear and the style that he reviewed, I thought, yeah, I think I could get into those knives. So Work Tough Gear has sent me two knives to review. I'm gonna show you the smaller one first. And this is the Wolverine, the Wolverine. I don't have any specs to give you right off the top, but it is a huge belt knife. Having said that though, it seems exceptionally well balanced in my hand for the size of the knife. This is almost as big as a, a Becker BK7. I think this is six and a half inches rather than seven inches, but you know, this to me would be like an improved version of a Becker BK7, or it looks a lot like an SE. It has much more of a contoured handle than either of them has. They are made with SK5 or SK85 Japanese steel. I did a little research into that, and if by all accounts, it is very similar to 1095 in nature. I don't think it has quite the same carbon content, but don't let that fool you. It's all about the heat treat. So what can I say about the heat treat on these so far? Well, today I've, I've tested them a little bit, but not out in the woods. Uh, they have a high saber grind and a polished convex edge on them. And I have not been able to do any damage or any dulling to these knives at all so far. It doesn't mean I won't with further testing, but so far these things have stood up really, really well. Tr true to my thoughts on belt knives, all I put through the lanyard hole, which is one of the hidden lanyard holes on the end, is just a little piece of orange cord so that if I lay it down because of its black handles, I'll be able to see where I laid it down. I don't feel the need for a full-size lanyard on this for chopping. Uh, I don't see this primarily as a big chopper. I like this, you know. It's maybe, it's right on the border of being too big for a belt knife, but I think I could still manage it, especially during the winter, and this was the only knife I was taking out with me, so I'm really excited to give that a try. Kydex sheath, variable mount on the back. Seems to be very well made, very well molded. You can take it on and off of your belt with this dome snap here. Here's my one comment on the sheath. Retention is almost too hard. Uh, I find it's very snug getting in and out. 
Um, I may just heat it up slightly. I may just leave it here in the sun and then, <laughs> and then let it stretch out a little bit just to open up the retention on that a tiny bit. But it's not a problem right now. Maybe it won't be a problem. I just, I just noticed that it was very, very snug. Okay, that's a big knife. This is a monster. That was the Wolverine. That's the middle size knife. There is a small version known as the Lynx, which I'm hoping to get a chance to try at some point in the future. And this is the large one. What plane is flying overhead now? Sounds like a small single engine somewhere. All right, if it doesn't get too loud, we'll just keep going. Work Tough Gear Kodiak. Look at the size of this monster. That is a huge piece of steel. I can't get it all in frame. Almost identical design to the Wolverine. It is over, over a quarter inch thick SK-5 steel. It is just a real chopping beast. The handle is similar, but it is downward curved with a much more pronounced uh, palm at the or hook on the end of it. And that is to allow you better angle with your hand for chopping. This is a chopper. And this, I did put a full size lanyard on for getting me a good, good grip. And there's a number of ways you can use a lanyard on a chopper knife. Other than that, it has a very similar design. As I said, that is a big knife. Can this replace an ax or a hatchet maybe? You know, it might. I guess the only way to know is to give it a try and see what I can do with it and maybe bring a hatchet out and compare them in performance. So one of the reasons I wanted to review this, because honestly, I don't need a lot of big knives like this. I have some others. But one of the reasons I wanted to review this came from a comment that a viewer in the UK put on one of my videos. It was the Tereva Scrama, either the 240 or the 200. And uh, they were disappointed and had to let me know that Verustalika was not allowed to ship them into England or they couldn't be imported into England. Verustalika could probably ship them, but they wouldn't get in. Let's put it that way. So they wondered if there was a, an alternative to the big Scrama 240 that they could purchase that would be legal. Honestly, I don't know the UK knife laws that well but I suggested the Condor Hudson Bay, which I've previously reviewed. I like that knife. It's a good, reasonably priced knife. But if this turns out to be every bit as good as I think it's going to be, and whether or not this can be shipped into the UK, maybe it has something to do with the size. Well, we'll see. Okay, what do I know about the company? Because that was one of the things I was interested in. This is very unique. This is not an American-made company shipping their or having their knives made offshore. It's an offshore company. So the owner of this company is in Taiwan, and that's where the factory is, and that's where these knives are made, is in Taiwan, obviously, to very high quality control standards. But here's what's really cool about it. They're not stealing anybody's designs. They're not stealing or, or copying or just modifying somebody else's designs. These are all original designs because they work in conjunction with knife designers, many of which are from the US and other parts of the world to produce their designs. And they have a profile for all of the designers, including Jonathan Heffron, uh, for one of the ones that he designed from Work Tough Gear. So I think that's great. There, that gives you the uh, design of the original designer as well as the budget design for these knives. These knives were originally designed by Aurora Borealis knives and uh, they're now being made by Work Tough Gear because obviously that's the most affordable way to make them. I don't know a whole lot more. In fact, I'll stop talking now and move on to the next knife. Let me put this one away. Nice Kydex sheath, same type of amount on it. Goes in and comes out much easier. All right, I have one more knife. How do I start this? Um, I think I mentioned some time ago that a good friend of mine, uh, Randall Graham, died of a heart attack. Uh, and he, the heart attack or the, the cardiovascular disease was the result of chronic Lyme disease. Now, not only was Randall a good friend of mine, he was internationally known as a master bladesmith. Uh, many of today's top knife makers learned at Randall's feet, so to speak. He is well known, maybe not as well known as 
uh, other knife designers and other knife makers are who have had their designs produce, uh, commercially produced. But in the knife world, there are very few people that don't know who Randall Graham is. And uh, he mastered the uh, traditional designs of mostly Sami designs. And uh, yeah, that was his. He liked to hand forge everything and he could do incredible work with a piece of steel. Well, here's was the good news. Randall's legacy continues here in Nova Scotia. Three of my friends, good friends, are actually former students of Randall's. I never got into knife making and uh, maybe I should have because Randall was a, an excellent teacher. Um, but three of my friends are have learned a lot. Now they've gone on to their own styles and they're producing a lot of different knives. But one person in particular was very true to Randall's uh, style of knife making. His name is Richard Brown. He lives in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia. And Richard made a knife for me in his own artistic design, but very much in the way he learned to do so from Randall Graham. So this is not a review, it's just a preview because other than playing with it at home, it has not been in the woods yet. It is a work of art. Now I had a budget, so I couldn't go all out on this, but for what I did pay, I, I'm just absolutely amazed. I won't be talking about price at all because every knife is unique and it's something between the buyer and the knife maker, Richard, in this case. So let's just start with the knife. This is a traditional Sami Luku or large knife. It has Richard's brand or maker's mark punched in on the side here, which is a B, I think it's an RB, uh, incorporated into one design. It is hand forged from 1085 steel, I believe. I'll give more information on it later. It is a hidden tang. It is double tapered to create balance. So the tang is not only narrow, it's narrow in all directions as it goes into the handle of the knife. And it's also narrows this way forward. You can still see forging marks on the top of the blade. It is a near full flat grind, probably better referred to as a high saber. Uh, Richard, like Randall's, try to hammer them down as close to the final edge as they can so they can do minimal amount of filing and sanding on them. So this is also true. Look at the brass. Hopefully you can see all hand dimpled. Antler, all designed and a lot of design work on it. Maple burl handle and an inset piece of antler in the end of this as well. And uh, what I really liked about working with Richard is, he said, can you send me measurements of your hand? Because he knew I had an extra large hand and he was, didn't know how he was going to adjust it to the size. He said, can you send me measurements of your hand? So what I did is traced my hand out on a piece of paper, put the measurements on the lines, scanned it and sent it to him by email. And he was able to take those measurements and without ever having put this in my hand, Got it, spot on. I know he sent to me a message, he goes, you sure this is gonna fit? This is so big, it doesn't fit my hand. And the answer is yes, Richard, it is absolutely spot on perfect. It is just, this is so light and nimble. I can do the light chopping that you do with a Luku. I can carve with it. I have no fears that this is gonna leave my grip at all. I can do extended carving with no fears of getting hot spots or hand fatigue on it. Man, I'm, I'm just so honored to own this, but it's not a safe queen. This will get used. I Not abused, but well used because I, you can't own a knife like this and not take it to the woods. This was built to be used. All right, the knife may be outdone by the sheath or very close to it. So here's the sheath. This is a traditional Sami center back seam sewn together, wet molded, with a wood liner. And I have pictures of the work as they progressed. And this is uh, a way of attaching it to the belt, a little bit less than traditional, but still very traditional looking on it. Also stamped by Richard's uh, brand on the edge of it. Let's see if I can get this in because he took some artistic license. I don't know, hopefully that's gonna show up there. Two roads diverged in the woods. 
And if you are a Robert Frost fan, or at least aware of his poem, that's where, of course, I get the closing for my videos about taking the path less traveled. So, man, okay. <laughs> I could go on about this knife at length, but it wouldn't be fair. Listen, listen to this. It snaps in as if it was Kydex. Perfect job. Only thing left to do is get some miles on it, some carving done with it, and then I'll come back and give you a more complete review on it. If I got anything left here? Whew. Okay, I've got to get into the shade somewhere to make myself some lunch because as you can probably see, the sun is just beating down on me and I think it's time now to have some lunch and I have a few more things to share with you. All right, so I found myself on the side of the trail and built my first ever fire in my Firebox Scout. I tried to record this video already but I had to move twice because the smoke kept following me which of course as you know is a real phenomenon wherever you are you're creating a vacuum to any breeze and that's where the smoke smoke wants to go is into the vacuum so I moved away it's just out of arm's reach here but uh, I moved away from the fire because I have another item I want to share with you and this one was in my food bag so I missed sharing it earlier and it's related to making lunch and I'm not using it today. I might just to, to test it, but it's not really a necessary part of the meal. And that is a meat thermometer or a cooking thermometer, however you want to refer to them as. This is a battery operated uh, meat thermometer that is from the company Chef Temp Final X Pro. I'm 80% sure I got it right. I will put it on the screen right or wrong. And this is a model that Chef's Temp has sent me for testing and review. And you might think, why would you want a thermometer like this out in the woods? Well, I'm gonna leave most of the discussion for the review. I have been using it at home, cooking in the house, cooking on the barbecue. I have yet to use it for anything I'm cooking out here in the woods, but that is my plan so that I can show it in use at a future video. But basically, one of the things that bushcrafters are often proud of themselves is how well they cook meat over a fire. But truth be told, most of the time the meat is overdone for fear of having it underdone, or it's burnt on the outside and raw on the inside, or somewhere in between. Because cooking over a fire is a real art and a science. It takes time to master that. No one should be expected to start a fire for the very first time and know how to cook a perfect steak or roast or chicken or fish or anything else. It takes time to learn these skills. There are so many variables involved, and we'll talk more about that in another video. But when I had the opportunity to take one of these things, I wondered how was I going to frame this as something a bushcrafter could use. Well, this may shorten down the amount of time it takes you to learn those skills. So if you're looking at a fire, you think the coals are just right for cooking, you've placed your cooking vessel over the coals, you're wondering if it's hot enough, you can always test the heat of the coals with your hand. There are guidelines, oh, we'll share that in that other video as well for doing so. So now you're cooking your meat, you're maybe or maybe not keeping track of the time, and it's not like there is a preciseness to the time time when it comes to cooking in the woods. That's where this comes in. You take this out, you unfold it, it instantly turns on, you push it into the meat or whatever it else is you're cooking, and within a couple seconds it gives you an accurate reading of what the internal temperature of your food is, and you know whether or not it is safe to eat and done. The difference between hard and gray and brown and pink and moist and tasty. All right, that's what it, this is, and it is a great tool for learning, and even experts don't necessarily always rely on their instincts. They use these. Is it necessary for cooking in the wood? No. Is it necessary for getting a perfect piece of meat every time? Well, if it's not necessary, it's very close to it. All right, that's all I wanted to share with you. I will be sure to put the link for this in the video description along with all the other things I've been sharing with you. I think my water may be hot now and it's time to put my dehydrated lunch together. And I wanna show you that because there's something about this that I wanna share with you. All right, here we go, here's lunch. It's a dehydrated meal, just something I put together at home. It involves mostly broccoli, cauliflower, uh, what else? Think, yeah, things like that that I, I have dehydrated and put in many meals. There's peppers in there. There's some carrots in there. There's a bunch of seeds like flax seed and hemp hearts and just the usual things that goes into a low-carb yet nutritious 
dehydrated meal that only needs water added. Now I have it in a plastic bag, but that's not what I'm gonna be cooking it in. I'm gonna be cooking it in something that I wanna share with you today that I've tried once to see if it would work. Um, I bought these on Alex. No, I didn't. I think I bought them on Amazon. Either way, I'll put the link for them in the video description. These are resealable food grade silicone bags. And they have measurements down the sides and everything else. They are waterproof and quite heavy duty. And I bought them explicitly for the purpose of transporting food out into the woods. So I wasn't constantly using plastic bags and then tossing them when I got home. I wanted something reusable, a little better for the environment, a little bit more sturdy as well. Well, then I got the idea, why can't I cook right in them? Silicone will withstand the temperatures of boiling water, and these are waterproof because I did test them, see if they will hold water. So why not actually put my dehydrated meal right in this along with the hot water and let it rehydrate right in the bag? It works. I'm going to do that today. All right, so that's the one thing. As I mentioned, I'll put that in the video description. They're not expensive, and they're quite handy to have. Okay. Two things. Viewers commented on earlier meals after I had made comments in them about my cooking. And one of the things was I had talked about thickening my, my soups up, that sometimes you put too much water in, maybe the ingredients don't uh, absorb all the water that you've put into your meal. And wouldn't it be nice to be able to have something that you could add that would thicken the meal up and make it a little bit more stew-like, I guess. And I, I use things like coconut flour because it does a pretty good job of that. But um, I had one of my viewers, Hillbilly Bob, make a suggestion and I thought spot on perfect. Not only will it thicken the meal up, but it will add much needed nutrition to it. And that is pork rinds. This is a bag of pork rinds. You can buy them very inexpensive at Costco, but you can buy them other places as well. And they're just exactly what they sound like, deep fried pork rinds. So what do you get here? You get fat and protein and, well, I don't know what else you get in them, but fat and protein. They're super lightweight and they rehydrate. I'm just gonna crush them up right in the bag and put them in with the meal. The other thing I had commented on is that Unfortunately, here in Canada, we cannot purchase the individual servings of Spam, the envelopes of Spam, like you can in the U.S. And I lamented that, and I had another one of my viewers, Red Sorghum, say, well, why not just take a full-size can of Spam, cut it into serving size, vacuum seal them, and then take those with you? So that's exactly what I did. Opened up a can of Spam, vacuum sealed them, and I think I had three or four out of a can put them into the freezer, and then just took it, took it out today for this meal. So that's the meal I am going to put together. So let's get started. I want to thank those two viewers. Oh, I haven't added the pork rinds before, so that's still a bit of an experiment. All right. These bags open up so that when they're full, they have a flat bottom, and they'll stand up on their own, but not until you put the water in, of course. So let's start with getting the dry meal in here. Now the bag that the meal is in, I'm gonna take home and uh, reuse for something else, but it's nice if I don't have to bring out two bags. They can get them in there. Ah, what's the difficulty here? There we go, okay, it's all inside. There's my meal inside. I think I'll put the water in first and then add the other ingredients. I've got a long-handled spoon. And since this is going to be very hot, a glove is necessary. Woo, hot water. Do this without boiling myself. Hope I have enough water in there. I'm on uneven ground here, but uh, it should stand up. Yeah, see, it stands up. What am I going to do? I'm going to put in my pork rinds. I think normally I would wait and see how well the meal rehydrates before adding the pork rinds. But... There we go. Sometimes these are referred to as pork panko because they're like a breadcrumb once they're all crushed up like that. Excellent. Stir that around. Oh yeah. 
Oh, this is working out well. Okay, one more thing, and that's the spam. I don't have anything to work on other than the package itself, but this will work. Up. Hit the ground? Nope. All right. Let's see if I can get that in there without dropping it on the ground. All right. Pine needles. Doesn't seem to matter. Still get them in there anyway. And stir that around. Put the cover back on, or the, what do you call it, a slider, I guess. There you go, just let it rehydrate. Now, if this was in the wintertime, I could drop that in a cozy, but in the summer, I won't need to. The silicone will do a fairly good job of keeping everything warm. In about 10 minutes now, I expect this to be fully rehydrated. And what I'll do is I'll bring you back and do a taste test. After that, I'm gonna put some more water on for coffee. And once I get the coffee made, I wanna show you the book I'm reading these days. I don't know, I didn't wait that long. I'm a little hungry. Boy, it's thick though. Let's see. Bandana on my knee. Oh yeah, it's thick. But did it rehydrate? Yes, it did. Got a bit of the spam. Mm. Now what happened to, yeah, they all dissolved. I wondered what happened to the pork rinds, but they're all dissolved through. So they did their job of absorbing everything. Can you see all that nice rehydrated vegetables, peppers, carrots? What else is in there? Oh, turnip, that's what it is, turnip. Mm. You know, I'm not sure. I mean, I've, I've, I've purchased, I've reviewed freeze-dried meals. And uh, they're convenient. You don't have to do any work. Just go to the store, pick them up, or order them online, have them delivered. They're reasonably good tasting. Reasonably nutritious. Found that pine needle. Not if you're on a low-carb or a ketogenic diet. None of the... Uh, offerings that I have seen will actually work well, except for maybe the scrambled eggs and a few of those. There is one or two companies, I think I've mentioned this before, one or two companies that cater to the low carb uh, diet and Next Mile Meals is one of them. I'd love to try it, but I will tell you now, they are pricey. So at the price for one of those meals, my goal is to see what I can make myself like this. Uh, I am working towards videos towards that end. Really, it's not a lot different than a lot of other people do in terms of showing how they make their dehydrated meals. I'll show dehydrating. I'll show you. I've still got the pemmican meal yet to come. But, you know, all of these things can be easily done at home with some relatively inexpensive equipment, such as a low-end, you don't need a high-end dehydrator. The better you can afford, the better, but, you know, you don't have to need a real expensive one. Vacuum sealer is absolutely not necessary. It's nice though, I'll tell you that, it's nice to have. Yeah, and you know, it's, it's, you just buy the vegetables when they're about to go bad, and those are the ones you dry. Uh, you can use fresh ones, of course, but this is a great way to use up ones that aren't, aren't doing so well. You can save a lot of money and make some pretty good meals this way. Especially days like this when you don't want to do a whole lot of work cooking over a fire. It's a lot hotter than I thought it was going to be today. It was only supposed to be about 20. And it's already 25, very humid. And the sun has found me again, so 
I won't be sitting here for too long. All right, I want to thank Hillbilly Bob and Red Sour Gum for your suggestions on things I can do with dehydrated meals. They worked out perfectly. I'll be doing that. That'll be a regular staple in my lunch bag for when I go up making meals like this. This silicone bag is working perfectly. It came in a set of four. This is the only one that was white. The others were pink, blue, and green maybe, but they're all the same size. And you can buy them in different sizes as well. Okay, I'm gonna finish this off. I'm gonna set back up and make myself a cup of coffee. And I have a book I wanna share with you. And that's when we'll come back. All right, so I decided to use my goshawk with the included pot with the alcohol stove to heat the water today. And it is boiling hard, so uh, Rampage Coffee. Rampage Coffee, of course. And I'm using the pour over device on top of my GI Canteen. And the one I'm using is the one that's based on the Helix. And I don't know, it doesn't sit especially stable on top of this. So I'm gonna put both of my gloves on because I can just foresee get trying to pour the water in and having that tip in and lose everything. So I think I'll do this with, now here's something I noticed. It's not gonna be easy trying to put that little siphon stove out inside of there. I have caps for the other siphon stoves but uh, it's quite a ways down inside. And I think if I use a magnetic uh, thing on top of it, I can reach down and snuff it out. But I already tried using one from a Trangia top and I couldn't get it down in deep enough to snuff it out. So anyway, enough said, let's start the water pour. So it is a pour over, so you just start slowly. Get a little bit of a soak going. So far, it's been pretty stable for me. Good. I don't think this uh, Helix, this, this spring coil pour-over device would be especially good in the winter because unlike a silicone one, it's not offering any insulative value. So. I think your coffee would cool down. Now, mind you, if you're using hot water and the coffee has to cool down a little bit before you drink it, but if it's really cold, you're probably not going to want to use this. You'll use something else instead. But it is nice and light and simple. And on most cups, quite stable. But not on the GI cup, just the shape of it. All right, that's a good sized cup of coffee going there. All right, so I'll let that pour through. And when it's at just the right temperature for drinking, I'll bring it back and share the book with you that I brought. I used softwood in that stove and you can see how black and tarry and sticky it gets from using softwood. I'm gonna to have to find some sand or gravel to... It's not coming off my fingers anyway. Something to grind it off a little bit with. Taste of coffee. All right, I may just finish up right here and enjoy my coffee. Now, I'll share the book with you because I am gonna sit and read on my glasses. So this is the latest book that I am carrying with me when I go out for the day and I have the time to sit and read. It's called The Lost Art of Reading Nature's Signs. Use outdoor clues to prove to Find your way, predict the weather, locate water, track animals, and other forgotten skills. And the author is Tristan Gooley. And this was a gift given to me by one of my kids or my wife. Christmas, Father's Day, I'm not sure. But it was sitting on my shelf for about a year because I had a lot of other books to read. Um, this is not something you see talked about, this specific book. You don't see this talked a lot about in videos because uh, well, who's going to do it? Who's going to promote these books? Obviously, authors are going to promote their own books, and there are some great books out there. Don't get me wrong. I have all of Dave, Dave uh, Canterbury's books. I think I have uh, Dan Wol Wolinchuk's book on the way. Uh, what's it called? Bushcraft Boy, I think it is. I have the Lars Velt series, 
I like my books. Do you get that theory? Uh, I have those as well. And I, I got to be honest, they're nice books. They're well detailed with pictures. But my goodness, they're basic. They, you know, they're not for the begin. Well, they're for the beginning bushcrafter. They're not for the advanced bushcrafter or outdoors person, unless you're just trying to pick up some little skill. So consider it a buffet. You're going through the book and you're reading. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, that's a good note. Okay, I remember that. That's what you'll get from those other books if you are been in the woods for any length of time and you have skills, and you've learned a lot already. It's nice to be reminded that you're doing the right things by those who supposedly do it. Oh, Paul Kirtley's, Ray Mears, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I've, I've got all the major brands of books, but a lot of them are rehashes. A lot of them have the same material packaged differently. All good. Okay, what can I say? This is different. This is something completely different. This is a, a way of being aware of your surroundings and allowing yourself to pick up the signs that you might otherwise miss. Now, you'll, the signs are there. It's just a matter of recognizing them for what they are. And it starts off with just understanding the lay of the land and, and how the lay of the land can affect everything and how weather can affect, you know, your experience out there. Oh, I got to tell well, you can see I'm only a short ways in. There's my bookmarker right there. I'm only short ways into this, but having perused the chapters, there is a lot to this book. And here's what's cool. It's not all that expensive. This may be in the 20 to $25 range. I'll put the Amazon link for it. And there's no pictures in this. Hopefully that doesn't turn anybody off, but there's a lot of information packed in here without any pictures taking up space that don't need to be. So you'll have to use your imagination, and this Tristan Gooley does a good job of describing things accurately enough that you can form the proper mental picture that you don't need a photograph or a drawing to do that representation. I would highly recommend you purchase this book and add it to your library. It's outside of the norm in terms of bushcraft books, but still very, very specific. If you have it, I'd be interested in knowing what your thoughts are on it. Um, like you said, I'm only a, kind of a short ways into it, an eighth of the way through the book, so I can't give it a, a comprehensive review. And I have another book that was just given to me as part of Father's Day. And it is called Braiding Sweetgrass. And I'll bring that book out at some time, but it's a really interesting book. I have uh, a few friends that are into plant identification, and one of them recommended this book. So my wife picked it up for Father's Day. And it's written by a Native American person who is also a biologist. And they weave together the stories of creation and First Nations belief into the accurate information about plant identification and uses. It doesn't get any better than that. It is extremely interesting. It's fascinating. You learn a lot and you have a whole new appreciation for a different way of looking at the world. Okay, that's two books I gave you information on. I'll put that in the video description as well if you're interested. Okay, this has been a day and it's only mid-afternoon and I've still got quite a bit of testing. I got to start swinging those big knives to see what they will do on wood. I've played with one of them already to get the fire ready and it's a champion and, and I like it a lot, but I've got a lot of other, and I've got another stove I haven't even taken out of the box yet or haven't lit a fire in, so I've got to do that yet today. If you have any comments, any questions about anything I've shown you, any questions or comments about anything at all, then put them in the comments section below. I'll make sure I put links to everything I showed you. I have to remember everything I've got. Everything I've showed you in the video description. Look forward to the reviews on those items. They'll be coming out staggered over the rest of the summer, I'm sure. Maybe even into the fall, depending on how my schedule goes for getting out. Yeah, beyond that, get out and explore and take that path less traveled because it will make all the difference. Bye for now.